everyone welcome and succeed. Our topic today is turning setbacks into comebacks. What doesn't kill you make you stronger, makes you stronger? Well, we must have heard that a lot of times in our lives and uh, that's like something that's ingrained in us. Setback, essentially, by definition, it means uh, interruption in progress. Now, our topic today is very interesting. Point is, how do we turn this interruption into a trampoline and bounce back stronger towards progress? We have with us Sahil Nayar, Senior Associate Director, HR KPMG India. He's also a behavioral scientist, design thinker, human storyteller, and writer. Welcome, Sahil. Very glad to have you with us for this webinar. Sharing the same platform with me is Professor Brita Singh of ISBNM Kolkata faculty and an acclaimed communication trainer. Sahil, Thank you so um, much for having me. Thank you. We are looking forward to sharing a lot of learning here. By learning, um, one of the aspects of your, um, what you do is you're a design thinker. So from that perspective, you know, a lot of learning also happens when people come together. You know, when they're in a very close contact, they learn a lot hands-on. So from that to the new normal that have restrictions in how many people will be there, there's also limitation of what kind of distance there should be between people. So how is the learning design going to change the future? Yeah, I think so. That's a, that's a very, very pertinent question because if you look at it, historically, uh, we had instructor-led classroom training, right? You had 100, 200 people in a classroom, you had someone who was a sage on the stage who knew a lot more than the others uh, would typically come in and give a lot of gyan and walk away. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think over the years, learning has become an entire process of co-creation, a process where learning just doesn't happen through the instructor, but learning also happens through peers and participants in the group. Having said that, I think uh, with the way uh, you know, we are in current times where the social distancing is becoming the norm. I think a lot of learning practitioners are spending their time thinking through the principles of design thinking and creating prototypes of how do we really learn as effectively, if not more, uh, through virtual mediums. Because man being a social animal, uh, really likes to play around, uh, be together, see what the other person's doing, uh, try and work closely, uh, which becomes a slight of a challenge when you are in a virtual environment. But uh, platforms like Zoom have actually created breakout rooms. So even if you have the ideal batch size typically reduces now, but you get into smaller breakout rooms, you have more facilitators who really help you connect, engage, and give you that personalized attention when there is a group setting. But having said that, uh, that is one way of looking at it. I think the second important piece is also the fact that uh, with this whole Netflix culture of learning, of hyper-personalization, uh, people find it very comfortable doing the dishes and at the same time listening to a podcast because everyone is working from home and working from or home. So while you work from home, you also work for home. And while someone's doing the dishes, they're listening to a podcast on a topic of their interest. So I think bite-sized learning, the opportunity to really pick up stuff at your own pace, at your own interest, and at your own flexibility uh, will redefine the whole design principles of learning as we really move into the future. Wonderfully said, um, and a lot of uh, multitasking. By I, I really like that word, bite-sized learning. You know, that's uh, very important. And uh, taking a cue from that, how essential then is uh, the question of self-awareness? Like when you learn, uh, Brita, would you like to uh, elaborate on that? Yeah, we know self-awareness, especially in today's situation where you might have to recreate yourself 
or perhaps look at different avenues for to start a new career or to go into a different profile you need to be i feel that you need to be essentially self aware about yourself your shortcomings and also what you can do would you say that self awareness is important especially since it allows you to be more adaptable more adjustable yeah i think i think brita you you put even puts the answer in the question itself uh, because uh, in today's times where everyone is on an equal footing uh, in terms of a, uh, the pandemic has been a great leveler of sorts and therefore given the unprecedented manner in which we all are exposed to the pandemic i think the whole concept of agility and adaptability uh, is taking center stage and to embrace agility and adaptability uh, no better way than to first start with going within instead of just going outside and going within is the whole concept of self awareness to saying how does brita react in a situation like this how does avirupa react how does sahil react and if each three if each of us are going to react very differently to a similar situation uh, how is it that we pretty much find out what's the best way to respond and not necessarily react and therefore uh, we keep learning on the go and as we learn on the go we have a heightened awareness of our own self and what are our enablers and what are our barriers because at the end of the day uh, it is only us and i'm a firm believer of that that irrespective of what the ecosystem has to offer to you uh, each one of us are solely responsible for whatever happens to us and it is just how we react respond in that situation that determines the next situation and the next and the next of course murphy came up with a law years ago uh, and that could be an exception to the case in point but my limited point in this case is to say heightened self awareness will be a key skill a key attribute a key perspective which will take center stage as people start learning to adapt with a lot of change and the pace of change that will only keep increasing as we move forward right sahil yeah avirupa go ahead Yes, uh, thank you from what you said. You know, we set our own uh, path of progress. We also, according to our self awareness, set our barriers. Coming to that, you know, there are some people, and I may sound gendered. It is because, uh, in case of women, it has been found maybe more. I would uh, trust your experience to to speak on that. So there are people uh, who put a glass ceiling for themselves. You know. say the company the organization identifies a resource and then grooms the resource gives him or her additional responsibilities you know not only lateral but also vertical responsibilities and to make that person to take the next level but when the time comes that person because of the glass ceiling that the person set for him or herself refuses that now that's a setback for the organization i would say you know you have to also retain a valuable resource like that but also kind of adjust to the personal decision of adhering to the glass ceiling how to turn that into a comeback so uh, i think that's a very very pertinent question and i want to take two steps back before i really come to answering your question right because the fact that you brought in the gender angle there uh, i think i really want to uh, give a perspective here which is more about uh, looking at saying it also depends what kind of society do we come from right So, if you're coming from a patriarchal society, uh, you will end up seeing a lot more of that play out in organizations. Because my firm belief is, organizations are only a replica of society, right? If you come from the matriarchal base, which a lot of states in our country also have, uh, you will pretty much see that the way it plays out and the kind of value system and the culture that those individuals bring to the organization will be very, very different. right so having said that i think that's the overarching belief that people really carry forward that's number 1 number 2 is a lot of men and again i may sound very cliche here but a lot of men say they love having strong women but the challenge is when a strong woman behaves like a strong woman 
a man doesn't know how to handle a strong woman, right? And, and therefore, what ends up happening is uh, the so-called barriers that you spoke about, which become very natural defense mechanisms or instincts start playing out. And that's when I would choose to believe, at least the woman that I've had in my life, be it my mother or be it very, very close friends, I have really seen that there is no limitation that holds bar. Absolutely no limitation. Because in their mind, they don't think of it that way. They don't bring in gender. They don't bring in barriers. They don't bring in limitations. Okay? Because it's not just the biological aspect of looking at it. It is also the whole aspect of connecting the individual to the individual. And I think, uh, and I'm going to say this out very clearly, I think women can do a far better job at it. A lot of men who have consciously worked on their feminine side, which is the yin and the yang, also bringing in a good balance. But I think naturally women are a lot more nurturing, a lot more caring, a lot more in sync with balance than men. Because men typically go the aggressive route, and again, I'm generalizing here, but they go the aggressive route, they go the high-pitched route, the aspirational route, to a very different extent to make things happen. Whereas a woman would really find great amount of balance in doing the right thing. Now, having said that, uh, as you grow up the ladder, and I'm going to be extremely politically incorrect here, incorrect here, sorry, uh, to really say that as you climb the ladder, it gets lonely at the top. And therefore, it becomes difficult to really sustain as you keep, because see, it, it's a pyramid, right? Let's accept it. It's a pyramid. And to keep getting up the pyramid, whether we call it or we don't call it, you end up chopping people along the way. And that's the only way you move up. Now, what's the basic DNA? Is the basic DNA allowing you to be as ruthless, if I may use the word, to start chopping people and moving up? Or... Are you very comfortable saying, okay, I am happy where I am. I think work is just a part of my life and not my entire life. And therefore, I'm very comfortable being where I am in my life right now. Maybe I am N minus 2, N minus 3. And I'm not really chasing that position. And on the other hand, you also have a lot of examples like the Indra Nui's, the Shikha Sharma's of the world who have done a great amount of work. Disproportionate representation of women on job. Yeah, and then, then if you really dig deep, and I'm sorry, I'm spending a couple of minutes more on this question because it's a very important question, very close to my heart, to say, are the Indra Nui's of the world less competitive? Have they not spent enough time with family? Of course, they've come and given interviews now post-retirement to really say, I wish I had done more. But uh, the, re the reality still is that they, they can give Anybody of you know run for their money in terms of skill and competence and leading large organizations. So therefore, I think the glass ceiling, which is where your question was, is not really outside. The glass ceiling is within your own mind. And I think if you can break that ceiling to say, my DNA, my value system allows me to do what it takes to get to a certain level, so be it. But I think the ceiling is more within. It comes with its own set of challenges, and that is gender agnostic. So I that was very encouraging. I mean, uh, as a woman, I feel uh, it's fantastic. I hope more people like you are there in corporates who think in the same way. I'm sure we are seeing a lot of change. We will see a lot more change in future, and the glass ceiling will really disappear. Um, talking about the, the pyramid, you know, and how ruthless it is, you know, it's often you have to kind of have very uh, ruthless judgments in terms of granting a promotion. So while accepting that failure is indeed um, an integral part of life and then learning from it is a core component of a successful career. But even then, when an when a employee works really hard you know, for the promotion and still kind of misses that coveted promotion, now that kind of setback is often uh, clouds him or her uh, performance, so to say, in future also. So how would you then tackle that from an HR point of view? See, I think, you know, this whole concept of saying work very hard, I think is a cliche. 
it's it's an absolute cliche tell me one person who doesn't work hard and the person who doesn't work hard will come back with a very very funny pun line to say i work smart right we've all heard it for so many years uh, i think the reality is to really show people the mirror not at the end of the year when they are expecting a promotion but through the entire journey to say one aspect about your career is performance which is performance in the role but the second equally important aspect is potential right and when i talk about potential i'm really referring to readiness for the next level are you in your current level already performing at the next level or the expectations of the next level and if you're not you can still be a brilliant person at your current level with very very high ratings on performance but not on potential and moving to the next level or a promotion is a strong combination of performance and potential and therefore what i keep you know i spend a lot of time with b school graduates on weekends at various campuses earlier and now virtually and my request to all of them is to do a little bit of crystal ball gazing to say while the world economic forum will definitely tell you what are the skills of 2020 2025 so on and so forth can you really envisage what's the next big thing that's going to hit us and can you then envisage what are the possible solutions that you can create for the next big thing because i firmly believe that employability is never a challenge the question is are you employable do you have those premium skills for which corporate india is willing to pay a premium and if you do trust me job or no job if you're connected with the right people to provide solutions for problems that exist there is a place for you uh, would you elaborate on the industry ready employability skills a little bit more for our listeners out there i mean i think sure i think industry ready is a much abused word right uh, because uh, let me just go back to the time when i passed out uh which was the whole time when recession hit us big time uh in india and uh, it, it's 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 absolutely the whole chicken and egg right uh corporate india says i want people who are experienced pressures are going to say listen if you don't give me a job how am i going to get experience right and therefore where do you really draw the line of saying oh you are industry ready oh come join us i think i think that's that's it's a very very abused way of looking at it i think what is important is as people start off their career i have heard and i have interacted with a lot of students who have barriers barriers like saying oh i will not join this organization it's not my dream company oh i will join this organization but i will not go and work in the hinterland because i have been born and brought up in south bombay and therefore how will i go and stay there you know chhopad patti garib logon ke sath bijli nahi aata hai khane ko nahi milega i won't get my butter chicken i won't get my single malt you getting what i'm saying so those are the kind of barriers that i've seen a lot of people because they think that oh i cleared my mba and therefore uh, i want to do strategy from day one let me tell you when i started my career um I actually started my career by learning how to punch papers. And I would punch papers and put papers down into box files. Okay? I started doing my career in that manner. And I think that if people have this notion in their head that day one of course I'll do strategy, I'll work in the CEO's office. Uh I'm not negating it. If you get an opportunity like that fantastic, do grab it. Uh, at least i didn't get it back then uh, but if you do get it i'll be very very happy for you but that may be very few and far in between the reality is uh, be open be agile pick up whatever comes your way you know but i want to do marketing i think marketing is fancy you know the sales and all is very boring who will go and do selling who will do sales i think if you ask and speak to any of the marketing legends in the country today or overseas they will critically tell you that the days they spent in sales were the best days of their life because they learned the ropes being very close to the customer right there 
right? Uh, so I think long answer to a short question, uh, but uh, be agile, be open, take what comes your way. Don't necessarily give in to everything that you don't like, but don't be adamant or sit on a high horse also because it's not going to take you anywhere. You know, your answer brings me to a point. You know, um, my father was in the army, so I've spent a lot of time there. Now, the attitude that they have is G Saab. You know, you say something, and the answer is G Saab, and G Saab means yes, I'll do it, and don't worry about it. So, you know, it is that kind of positive attitude. How important do you think that is? You know, that attitude which says, yes, I can, and yes, I will. You know, that kind of an attitude could actually help people to understand that you don't necessarily have to start with Amazon. You could start as you did with paper punching and then you, yes, I can your way upwards. Absolutely. I think that's a brilliant point you brought out, Britta, because if you really look at it, it is, yes, I can. Yes, I will. And if I can just add, if I can't, I will I learn know. it. And once I learn it, I will do it, right? Uh, but, you know, uh, it's coming back to the army piece because I also have a couple of relatives who've held very senior positions in the forces. Uh, and I'm going to take the liberty to say this while all my respect to all the forces, um, I think this whole analogy of G Saab, right, also needs to be questioned at a certain level. And when I say questioned, I don't necessarily mean the attitude. The attitude is fantastic because I will get it done. I'll figure it out. I'll get it done. But sometimes when it doesn't make sense mm -hmm. and you know that there is an order to go at a particular place, uh, which is going to be suicidal because of some other Western interest, no, is it really it's not fair? GSA. Exactly. Exactly my point. Then it is not GSAP. So then it is about saying, coming back very quickly to corporate India, then it's about saying, can you challenge status quo? Can you really say that this organization is like this? But my dear friends, hello, why is this like And if no one has ever asked this question, being absolutely respectful and being absolutely uh, in line without sounding arrogant, can we just humbly ask, okay, I understand that for the last 10 years, it's been happening in this manner in this place, but I have a different idea. Can I table my idea? And can we explore it? Maybe you've seen a lot more Diwalis than me and it may fail, but can I try and do it in my own small way? And if I taste success, can we do it as a pilot and then can we replicate it across the organization? Because in that whole G Hazuri and G Saab, you don't really innovate. You just take orders and you execute orders blindly. And that kills your creativity, that kills your thinking. So I know, Britta, where you were coming from, very different example to say attitude, completely agree, G Saab. But creativity, innovation, orders, instructions, requests from senior colleagues to say, fantastic. You want me to do something? You're telling me do it this way? I hear you. But I also think there are three other ways in which I can do it. Can I explore those? Because maybe it's faster, it's more efficient, it's more practical, it's more creative, it's more innovative. And therefore, that's the added dimension that I just wanted to add to your question. Fantastic. You're talking about being more effective. I mean, the innovation would bring in greater effectiveness. Yeah. Yes, not just definitely. effectiveness, not just effectiveness, but also efficiency. Yes, not just efficiency, efficiency yes. but also creativity. Not just yeah. creativity, but also the ability to fail and then succeed. Yes. See, it's not just always about being successful, getting it right every time, the first time. It is also about trying something out, failing, and realizing because if you ask and talk to the most successful people in the world, they will say, Are my lessons of leadership have come from my biggest failures not from what I got right the first time brilliantly. Yes, I, mean, I, think, I would like to quote, yeah. quote from an article that I read of New York Times in 2000, uh, late 2019. It says that it, it 
talks about a paper which was published in Nature Communication. And there, uh, the, one of the co-authors from Kellogg's uh, School of Business, he said that, you know, they have done a, a good amount of data, research data, and found out that apparently early career setbacks, people with early career setbacks are, you know, counterintuitively, they turn out to be uh, the better performance, having a better career than people who have never had a setback in their lives. So, uh, but then, then again, when we're talking about, um, you know, following instructions, there are some times when following instructions become a kind of a burden. I'm talking about retrenchment and downsizing, which is happening right now. More than 122 millions of jobs uh, were lost, but Fortunately, 75% of them was from the medium uh, SM, MSME sector, but then the salaried uh, and so-called permanent jobs are also not safe. So in this situation, we can understand that uh, this is going to be quite common. It has been common, but it's going to be more common now. So there are two perspectives here. One is uh, the perspective of the manager who is asked to identify people in the team to uh, who the, he or she has to ask to leave. Now that, I have friends whom I have seen, I've confessed to me, written on Facebook even, you know, how much stressful that is. It's a huge setback for them as a leader. And the other is from, uh, for people who are retained, but they have, who have seen uh, their team members uh, gone, you know, the heads have rolled. So for them also it's a setback, although they have, retain their job. So these two setbacks are very real. If you could talk about strategies to ensure comebacks. So I, I, I think, see, let's look at this very pragmatically, right? Uh, these are tough times. Uh, needless to say, these are tough times. Organizations who are in the manufacturing space and others, and I'm specifically calling that out, is because operations have been shut for a very long time, ex except accession services. Uh, other organizations who've been able to pretty much have BCP in place and migrate uh, to work from home kind of models have done much better. But overall, look at the overall arching principle. Luxury brands have been hit the most. You'll agree with me. Now, if someone is working in a luxury brand uh, where people have moved from lifestyle kind of expenditure to livelihood kind of expenditure, which is just on basics, even organizations like that will have a certain threshold to which they can keep supporting employees, supporting their families. If the intent is right, of course, they will find a way in which they can carry people along and carry people through these difficult times, right? But beyond the point, it becomes extremely difficult because that is the harsh business reality. Now, having said that, uh, a lot of people have come together and a lot of community groups have been formed a lot of people, close friends of mine who are certified counselors, uh, who are psychologists, have really come forward pro bono to help people who have really encountered these setbacks. And the intent is to really effectively engage them to say, it is not about you. It is the problem. And when you differentiate the problem from the individual, half the issue is solved. The moment, I'll repeat myself, the moment you differentiate the problem from the individual, half the issue is solved. But if you make the problem the individual and say, the problem is with you, Sahil, that only aggravates the problem. So and I think- to, You have sorry. to think that it's not I that's being thrown out. It is the situation which has compelled this, this to happen. Yeah, yeah. It because so that's one. It is temporary. Situations will improve. I mean, it can. Yeah. I mean, we are looking at a at a brighter future. Sure. As... So that is one way to look at it. But I think so. At times, it's extremely important to also smell the coffee. And when I say smell the coffee, I'm really saying that there are a lot of people who have been carried by their organizations for a very long time, because in India, loyalty matters a lot. And today it is becoming difficult for organizations to carry those employees who have been very loyal 
sitting on high compensations and not delivering that kind of value because they have not kept themselves relevant to the changing skill sets and changing roles then while you there it we will be doing injustice to the individual to say the problem is not you we will be doing injustice to them and their careers and their future if we tell them oh you are brilliant the problem is the pandemic so i think bringing authenticity genuineness to these conversations to say of course it's the pandemic of course it's the whole crisis situation but it is also a little bit to do with your skill sets and your relevance in today's times and therefore enable the individual to build skill sets so that when situations return to normal the individual should be the first person to get a job and that person becomes even more grateful because you've shown that individual the mirror to say use the next 6 months 1 year to build skills that make you relevant as compared to letting that person remain in la la land and say oh it's only pandemic and one year later the poor guy or girl doesn't really get a job because redundancy sets up right so honesty and empathy i think those two were the the tools that you were talking about yeah right yeah i think and above have- honesty i would also like to add genuineness and authenticity you know uh, you can be honest and you can be fake honest also because a lot of people end up doing that but i think yes. if you're genuine authentic and empathetic i think that will be a brilliant combination yeah yeah that i was going to ask you about empathy in dealing with an employee's personal setbacks and you have already answered that question we have two questions here on facebook one of them is from professor ashish mitra from the calcutta isbn isbnm which asks you how do you nurture high performance high potential people what are the retention policies for them sure so i think professor mitra good question uh, if you really look at high potential or high performing individuals uh, these guys are essentially what i call as self starters right so there are two kinds of people one are self starters and one are kick starters you know if you remember the old uh, scooters bikes. that we used to have yeah the old bikes the old scooters now you have a self start button but earlier it used to take a lot of effort to really kick start the bike especially in the morning in the winters so individuals are also of two types kick starters and self starters so i think high performing individuals high potential guys are self starters uh, they hate micromanagement they hate people sitting on their head monitoring them all the time i'm generalizing here but most of them really like the the space the freedom the ability to put them on challenging projects to make them think uh, guide them where necessary because just because someone is a high potential doesn't mean that person has answers to all the questions if you are higher in the hierarchy you've seen more diwalis than the individual and therefore your ability to come in at the right time show direction and step back i think is a wonderful virtue so that they then understand in which direction they need to go and they can effectively contribute having said that i think the reward and recognition for them is very very intrinsic but at the same time uh, they like to be put on projects which really challenge them uh, help them explore parts of them that they didn't know exist and i think beyond any kind of compensation monetary non monetary rewards recognition praise which all of us faces our needs fulfill um when they really get on to projects that challenge them that help them explore a new side to themselves i think that to them is the biggest reward there is another i don't think it's really a question it is a comment and it alludes to a comment that you had made earlier on when you talked about potential so the this is jp rat from the isbm pune campus who has written the word potential leave much to chance at senior levels if the management makes a mistake then they have committed themselves to the peter principle wherein a good person has been promoted to a level of incompetence 
Good organizations require the candidate to show consistently for two or three quarters that they're able to handle the next level of work before they are assigned to the next level. Yeah. So, so that is a comment, I think. Absolutely, yeah. But I think it's so very well put because each one of us at some point in time hit our own level of incompetence. The question is, do we realize? And do we realize soon enough? And do we make the necessary amends? So I think, I think very well. Sahil, uh, talking about uh, you know, retaining employees and the rate of attrition, like that is a huge challenge for any HR, uh, I would believe. And especially when you were talking about this, the, the new students, like the millennials, they have their very different aspirations in life. Like their life goals are very different from the traditional uh, life goals that were there in the employers, which had a pattern of reward and recognition, which would connect to professional goals. But then for these millennials who are very suggest are a techniques to motivate them. Sure. So I think so you had a patchy network. I lost you slightly yes. in between, but let me quickly pick up three aspects of your question. The first aspect, of course, is uh, it's not the sole responsibility of HR, right? Uh, imagine if you're working with your boss who is in business day in and day out, and of course, HR is expected to know what's happening, be connected with the business, know the pulse of the floor, but if I am leaving because of my boss in business, tell me honestly how much can HR do about it? Because people don't leave organizations, they leave bosses. Absolutely. So I think it's a shared responsibility between business and HR. That's point number one. Point number two, coming to your whole point before I get to millennials, I think it's the mindset. And when I say mindset, what am I referring to? Do we really treat our team members like a pair of hands or do we treat them like humans with a heart, mind, body, and soul? If you treat our team members like a pair of hands, you will always have a transactional relationship with them. Ah, ye kaam hua? Achha, ye ho gaya? Kya pending hai? Kitna ho gaya? That's a transactional relationship. And trust me, if you think others don't get it, of course they get it. Okay. But if you treat someone like a holistic human being to say, hey, I know you joined in five minutes late for the morning meeting. I know that you know how important that meeting was. But what happened? Was there a connectivity issue? Was there an internet issue? Did, did you have something back home that held you back? Automatically, the person knows that you're caring for the individual. As compared to saying, you know how important this meeting was? Why didn't you connect? You knew you have connectivity issues. Why didn't you log in 15 minutes earlier? You see the difference? And that is when retention begins. Because then people work for people and people necessarily work with people and not just for people. And then you also have the extreme category of people who are saying, like Britta mentioned earlier, ji huzur. You tell them to jump from the 10th floor, they will jump with no questions asked. You tell them to sign on a paper, they will sign on a paper with no questions asked. Why? Because it's like a family. Many people say that, oh, I welcome this family member to the family when they send announcements in their organization but do you really treat people like family because when you treat people like family and i don't necessarily mean to say you need to be goody goody all the time in families also we have disagreements in families also we have fights in families also we have different points of view but a family is a family is a family okay uh, that's the second part to dealing with retention and the mindset around do you treat people as people do you know what's happening in their house uh, what are their children's names which school do they go to what admission issues do they have and going beyond just work right and the third piece is on millennials i think uh, i'm a big fan of simon sinek i like the way he really puts stuff out on millennials in terms of instant gratification here and now 
uh, different kinds of rewards, different motivators, different factors. Um, and I firmly believe that one size doesn't fit all. And therefore, going back to the point that I mentioned earlier, the whole concept of adaptability to say, what will make a millennial happy or tick will be very different from what will make a Gen X or a Gen Y tick. And therefore, a couple of things that work very well with millennials is if you like something, if you like the work they've done, say it here and now. Don't wait for a monthly reward program or a quarterly reward program to say, let me think which is a good award to give, but I need to look at other people's performance, so on and so forth. Of course, maintain parity, but ensure that you do it in the moment. Ensure that you personalize it. If you do, if you do a very generic thing, it's not going to work. So personalization, in fact, I would say hyper-personalization if you can, which is essentially the whole bouquet of awards that we talk about. If I know that Sahil is someone who loves kayaking, can I really gift him a coupon of saying, okay, Sahil, I know I've seen you on social media. Uh, you, you put up pictures of going kayaking or you love going for golf. Uh, here is the next five sessions of golf for my side, right? I think that makes a lot of difference as compared to say, yeah, those are rupees for Amazon voucher, which are Yeah, so that's the whole concept of personalization here and now. And most importantly, can you really, with millennials, show them stuff that they can't see and enable them to achieve it? Because no bigger pride or sense of satisfaction and reward by challenging people on their strengths and taking them to a better place by helping them become a better version of themselves. That's a fantastic answer. But then uh, before I uh, move on to the next question, I request my our listeners or audience to please key in your questions, throw the questions at you. Sahil is here. And he is ready, as always, to take any issues that you have, any questions that you have to ask. Anything that you want to know about employment, employability, skills, anything, please write right now in the Facebook page. Sahil, um, while I was listening to you, you know, um, I also thought that there's a very fine balance between uh, personal and professional, right? So when you talk about you know, knowing an employee through and through, uh, even, you know, tracking their social media um, activities. So isn't that like a sort of a breach of privacy? Say, for example, a person has a, has a personal setback, very personal in nature. He might not want to discuss it in a professional setting. So then how, how do you, you know, bridge that gap or balance it very fine, you know, fine tune uh, that balance? So Aviru, I'm going to be very, very candid on this one, right? Uh, Anything that any individual puts on social media no longer remains private. Okay. So if you're comfortable as an individual putting stuff out on your Instagram, on your Twitter, on your LinkedIn, on your Facebook, it is for the world to see. Right. And if it is for the world to see, it is for the world to comment, for the world to troll, for the world to ridicule, for the world to appreciate. If you're going to be so sensitive about saying, oh, my privacy, ladies and gentlemen, please don't put anything on social media. Absolutely fine. No one is forcing you to put anything on social media. But if you're going to be hungry for the likes, for the appreciation, for the recognition, or for the world to know what you're doing, the world might not really love what you do. You may love doing it, but the world might not love it. And therefore, you need to take it in your stride, number one. Number two, I think having said that, there are boundaries that we need to respect. So if you're going to use certain data which is available on social media against employees and trying to be sarcastic about it, I think that doesn't go in good taste. That really doesn't go in good taste. You know, uh, we've all heard of this, many managers track their team members on social media and say, Achha, tumhe time mila weekend ko khandala jane ke liye. Baut maza karke aya. But ye report tumse nahi bana. Right? And right. trust me, right? And people say, Achha, thik hai ho. Tumne to bula tumhe bukhar tha. You took sick leave. But actually, I saw your post. You were going out and you were having a great time somewhere else. 
right? I think that is extremely poor taste. But what if I have I see on uh, on one of these social media whatever platforms that an employee has suffered a personal setback, has not shared it officially with anybody, and I have noticed that he is depressed and not being able to perform as well. Can I not be more empathetic in my approach to him? Ask him questions indirectly to say, is there something that I can do to help you? And perhaps bring it out of him, because sometimes when you talk, you feel better. Absolutely, Brit. I think so. You've highlighted the positive side of it. Uh, I think that's a, a huge avenue for many people to actually do. But I think <clears throat> what we really see is casting aspersions or allegations uh, on looking at social media or otherwise is a complete no-no. On the aspect that you mentioned, which is the other end of the spectrum, I would definitely say tread with caution. Uh, because uh, that is personal space mm. and uh, people who are not comfortable. And again, I, I didn't qualify your statement, but if you're saying if someone has put in, uh, you know, a personal setback on social media and not shared that with the manager or with the team members or colleagues, uh, I think that that is real stupidity. Because uh, either you're so uncomfortable talking about it and very comfortable putting it on, which is easier to do because there's no human contact. Yes. But then the reason why I said tread with caution is because that same challenge will continue for the individual. Because if I am not comfortable, Britta, just say if you're my boss, if I am not comfortable coming and telling you that Britta, I've had a personal setback and therefore maybe the next one week, I won't be at my optimum level of performance and please be slightly comfortable or soft on me. I'm not comfortable having that chat with you, but I'm comfortable putting it on social media because I know that Britta will see it there. And then if you come and ask me on a Monday morning in a very polite, nice way to say, oh, Sahil, how are things? How was your weekend? What did you do? When you start using the probing technique, even though there may be a lot of empathy embedded, status quo, if I'm not comfortable sharing in person, would it I really be happen. comfortable? It won't happen. Chances are, I don't want to rule it out, but I'm saying probability is very high, it won't happen. And therefore, mm -hmm. maturity says, without you having to discuss it with me, can you sumoto automatically be more empathetic? That was actually my question. Yes. Is that if I have found that out, yeah. I could be more empathetic in my approach towards you, Correct. not telling you that I know. Without but, validating, there is no need to yes, validate. Yes, but just be more empathetic. And yeah. I think at this particular time, when you know, uh, sometimes you have three generations living in a two bedroom flat, you can have all kinds of personal tensions and frustrations, anger, God knows what. And these, have, these would have an effect on a person's performance. Yeah, and I also an think effect. that, absolutely, you're, you're very right. And I also think that let's not wait for people to call it out or for mm -hmm. us to call it out. Yes. I think the whole ability of sensing plays a very important role. Yeah. If you can sense and with technology, and therefore I keep encouraging the team to come on video calls, right? Because when you're on audio calls, it becomes difficult to really get the tone of the voice. Uh, you, may, you may end up missing it. But if I can see you, I can obviously know that, oh, you don't look all right. Uh, is everything okay? I can maybe pick it up as an offline one-on-one -on -one conversation after the group meeting is over, the team meeting is over. And therefore, video calls are a good, but at the same time, respect boundaries. But if people are going through stuff, I think care and concern should definitely be priority uh, because while work always takes precedence, you will realize that work will start dipping if basic hygiene factors are not in place. So empathy plays a very important part in teamwork, managing people, your interactions, everything. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think very fundamentally, while all of us get it, I still want to call it out to say, empathy is very different from sympathy. Mm -hmm. Totally different. Yeah, we all get it. Most of us get it. Uh, yeah. But when we play it out, it might come across as being sympathetic. 
And trust me, in today's world, I have met a lot of people. No one wants sympathy. I have two questions from the uh, the Facebook thing. Sure. One is, this is from Professor Shomi Gangupadhyay, again from the Calcutta campus, where he has made a comment. Are millennials in some kind of a time travel and that they want to taste the flavors of Generation X? Will they rephrase their perception? Can you elaborate a little more if, uh, if we can have that? Uh, because I'll ask, uh, I'll, I'll ask him. Yeah, and because I want to get question. to the essence of his question because when you say yes. tasting the flavor of Gen X, are we saying they want to taste success soon? If that's the question, if I understand it right, if there's something else, I'll happy to understand the yeah. essence of the and question then, yeah, before I respond. i the second question and ask him to elaborate. The second question is, since you are a firm with deep accounting roots, do you offer similar salaries to all new entrants, irrespective of their professional backgrounds? Okay, so I'm here in my personal capacity and I would like to uh, restrict it to that, please, if you don't mind. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, so, uh, there's another part of the story which we were talking about, like, you know, of course, there will be crisis and there will be times uh, where there's a lot of surge in, in employment. You will have times when there'll be huge challenge in sourcing the right kind of people, right? Sometimes you'll have a lot of applicants, but not the right people. But, and then the management institutes turn out MBAs and graduates um, who would like to jump that ship on that ship. But then what is the gap? Like how, do, how can management institute become more uh, effective in bridging that setback and making people their the fresh freshness more uh, you know attuned. Okay, now you've touched a chord, uh, and I'm sorry, but you'll have to wait to really hear this answer out. <clears throat> and this is going to be a complete boomerang back at you, Avirupa, because uh, this is not about uh, your institute or MBA colleges, but it is more to do with the larger ecosystem. Yes. Tell me how many people who register for an MBA don't get an MBA degree. Every single student who registers for an MBA is assured an MBA degree. And correct me if I am wrong, change the institute, change the city, change the location, the degree is guaranteed. What will happen? You will fail an exam, you will give a re-exam, you will get the degree. You will get lesser marks than what you would have otherwise got, but you will get the degree. Very unlike the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India. If you look at the model and understand the model of ICAI, they pretty much play on demand and supply. And therefore, the pass percentage of people is a lot, lot lesser basis the demand that exists. And this is simple economics, we've all studied it. When demand is high, supply is low, what happens to price? Yeah, it goes up, but then it's... Simple, so price goes up. And when demand is low, supply is high, what happens to price? But then in the new, new norm, I mean, there's also a saying in economics, the demand creates its own supply. No, 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 so let's not get into the theory of economics. Let's get to a very simple, practical implementation to say, how many MBAs who are passing out even know what they have studied? You come to semester three, and if I ask you, Henry, for your 14 principles of management, I can do an open bet. 30% of any MBA college, any student will not know the answer. And 30% okay, so I'm being conservative. The, the fundamental point I'm trying to make here is marks don't assure a job. Okay, so how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? Good question. Do we have the courage to say you will not get a degree? Or are we sitting on that fence to say, I can't take that step because I need to fill so many seats next year. And trust me, this is a problem because I've been associated with this fraternity for a very, very long time. 
and I understand it in and out from the regulators to the promoters to the colleges to the students. Everyone is it in it hand in glove. You ask a placement coordinator to say, why don't I have 100% placements? He or she will tell you, I will get the best companies on campus, but I'm sorry, the students don't cut the mark. And then I can't leverage my personal relationship year on year. I can't bring them next year. You ask the faculty saying, listen, why don't students study? Why don't they cut the mark when the best companies are coming on campus? They will say, I walk into the class with great amount of motivation, but then people don't attend. And you know, there is a certain attendance percentage. They attend, but they don't pay attention. And then what is the motivation for me beyond class four, class five? They are mature adults. Do I need to treat them like kids and say, listen, pay attention. It's for your own good. The kid sitting back there is going to say, you know what? Brilliant professor has great pedigree, has great knowledge, but just can't communicate. Keeps muttering, muttering, muttering in his own mouth. And I can't understand. I can't comprehend. I don't get it. So I think this whole system needs a massive shake. And it needs a shake to say, today, do MBA colleges get rated on whether it is NAC or any other accredited body, not just based on what faculty you have or what campus you have or what lovely placements you do or foreign internships you have. Let's get to basics, guys. Are we accrediting MBA colleges on saying what was the level you got people in at and when they left, did they leave better? And when they yeah, left yeah. better, did they, sorry, I'm just going to complete this last 30 seconds. Yeah, when yeah. they left better, are they so-called in your parlance industry ready? This is the question I want to ask, which is, one is to separate the wheat from the chaff at the college level. The other is the wheat from the chaff at the employment level. When they go to a company, what does the company look at? What do they, they're not looking at merely the marks. So how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? And quite recently today, I think it was this morning that I read about this particular data analytics thing, which measures attitude, confidence, and God knows what else and helps the HR of a company to understand the applicants. Is that so? Yeah, so a lot of tools are out there which do a lot of stuff. <clears throat> but my limited point is coming back to your question. Marks don't guarantee knowledge. Absolutely not. And knowledge alone doesn't guarantee a job. Mm. So where's the missing link? I think it's a combination of what I call ASK, ask. Do you have the right attitude? Do you have the right skills? And do you have the right knowledge that you can apply at the right time? And I think it's a brilliant blend of all three. The attitude to say, if I don't know, I will figure out, but I will get work done. The right skill to say, I know what's trending. I know that if I just know Microsoft Office, it's not enough. I need to know Power Apps. I need to know Tableau. I need to know R. I need to know Java, so on and so forth. And more importantly, yes, knowledge is important, but tell me, and I'm asking this question open out loud. How many people who have graduated or alumni or seniors in the fraternity have utilized their MBA knowledge, per se knowledge in the work they do on a daily basis? Well, I can tell you, Simon, that. Uh, I can tell you, Simon, that we have had alumni alumnus in, uh, in our webinars, and all of them talked about the balance of academics and hands-on skill learning of ISBNM. We have been uh, fortunate to have a hand percent placement uh, for bachelors on bachelors. And our alumni still you know, swear by the industry readiness that we already put them through in, while in the two years of ISBN, which is a combination of what you said, you know, they, they will be develop the right attitude by putting them through uh, different, you know, challenging situations, uh, then testing them. Uh, in no, the no, so Avirupa, I, I completely agree with you because Dr. Pramod Kumar is a very, very close friend of mine and I have really uh, been with him over the last couple of years and I've seen the kind of rigor that's there right at the top. And of course, with people like Britta, you and the entire faculty, I'm sure that your institute does a great job. 
Uh, but having said that, I'm, as I said, I'm not getting individual specific here or institution specific. The, the larger point that I was trying to make was between this whole concept of knowledge, marks, employability, where do we find that sweet spot? And that is something that a lot of MBA colleges need to start answering now because otherwise the ROI on investment over a period of time will become questionable. That's the limited point that I was making. Sahil, uh, since you're a human storyteller, which is which I find is very interesting, you must have lots of you know, stories from your work, from your life as well. So if you could share one of one or two of those, which would uh, enliven and uh, inspire us. Okay, so I'm going to share with you a quick story, um, and this is a story about a small kid who went to a convent school. Uh, and he had this whole thing that really, really excited him whenever he went on stage. So it used to really give him a lot of happiness, a lot of excitement. Maybe it was the people who sat in the audience and this person, this small kid was on stage. Maybe it was a need of appreciation. Maybe it was a read of recognition. This kid was all of seven, eight years. He didn't really know what it was. But all he knew was that he was very, very happy and very excited being on stage. So he started registering for public speaking, uh, would go on stage, be part of the dramatics club of the school uh, and participate in all of that. The first time he went on stage, this young little kid uh, turned absolutely cold, right? Cold as if he had 104, 105 degrees fever. Uh, and uh, his teachers would say, okay, why aren't you saying something? You know, maybe just recite a poem or share a story or say something. Uh, but this guy would just freeze. And every time he would come back down, he would be subject to the ridicule of all the students who would laugh and say, oh, yeah, he would come back home. He would share this with his father and mother to say, you know, I love doing this. This is my passion, but I don't know why I'm significantly struggling. Uh, you know, tough life, a uh, lot of the whole ridicule, the whole mocking. All of that got to him so bad that a year later, he started stammering and significantly stammering. And this is the point I wanted to highlight as first milestone of the story that when someone is not as good as you or someone is not good at what he or she wants to do, if you can't help, please don't ridicule, please don't make fun, please don't mock at because you may move on in your life, but you don't know what you've done to that individual or how you've damaged that individual. Fast forwarding the story, uh, this kid uh, obviously used to stammer, uh, kept stammering, uh, would go cold on stage, but still kept going on stage, kept listening to the mocking, the ridicule, participated in drama, passed out from school, went to college, tried being a compare. Uh, tried being an MC at events, tried to overcome his stammering because he realized the only way to get better at it was to practice and practice and practice. Uh, fast forward two decades later, one and a half, two decades later, uh, this person is in front of you. Uh, and uh, uh, I think so. I, I think I do a reasonably good job of communicating, of sharing my stories. Uh, but I think formative years were very, very difficult. Um, I remember the times I used to stammer. I completely lost confidence in school. I thought I would never be able to speak. I always thought it was good to keep quiet, not to talk, uh, just keep my ideas to myself. Uh, but I worked on it. I have stood in front of the mirror reading out from the newspaper. I have done a lot of effort. And I'm sure, like me, each one of you do a lot of effort in all the areas you want to get brilliant at. Uh, so my only two things as part of the story as takeaways are one, if you can't help someone, don't harm them. And number two, there is nothing in this world, I'll repeat, there is nothing in this world that you can't overcome. If I could get rid of my stammering, you can get rid of anything that is holding you back as a barrier today because every setback has a comeback. Thank you so much. That was really, really motivating, very sort of uplifting. Actually, that what you said, Sahil, is so important for people like us who are actually helping students to grow. And we have to be so very careful that we don't demotivate them or criticize them and kill their initiative. 
we have to make sure that they understand that you know that there is a way that they can overcome whatever problems they have right. now i have a million comments to share with you one is dr kumar says hello to you the please do convey my is, regards as well yes and the other is that you know that question about the millennials it was about do the millennial millennials want to share taste the lifestyle of generation x sure so brother i'll try and answer that question very quickly but i'll have to then just jump off this webinar because i have something else lined up as i had mentioned to you uh but yes of course i think millennials have this sense of entitlement and i don't think there's anything wrong with it being a millennial myself i think entitlement is good to have but entitlement needs to be earned if you're not going to earn it and you're going to expect it's going to come on a platter to you forget it it's not going to happen if you're going to have an an, an ecosystem that's going to not enable you voice your thoughts go out there ask for it but ask only after you deserve and deserve only when you earn it those are my limited thoughts there Rupert I think Sail would like to be I'm any... sorry but I have another webinar I need to jump on to but I think this was brilliant yeah you guys were fantastic Thank and if there are any much. questions if there are any questions as i said last time as well uh, this is just a quick uh, catch up session but i'm available on linkedin just feel free to punch in a question i'll be happy to respond uh, because i don't like to leave any question unanswered so if there's any question that is still not answered feel free to drop in a line on linkedin i'll be more than happy to respond and connect with you offline thank you so thank much thank you very much thank you thank so you much and much. goodbye goodbye and uh, dear audience please stay tuned for all our future series webinar series and for now we take leave bye bye thank you prita thank you our audience thank you sahil for this wonderful time together. thank you so much thank for having so me much. have you. a nice weekend bye bye